What is going on, everybody? It's Clint from the Die Hard MMA Podcast, your host as always, and I am coming to you today with my weigh-in recap video for Poirier versus Hooker. We got a good one this week, folks. First off, let's start with the bad news. My guy Brahimaj is off the card. Apparently, his corner tested positive for COVID, so unfortunately, ah, that was a two-banger, two-unit bet on a nice, juicy underdog. We beat a huge, huge line move. Solid value. I loved that spot, and it's just gone. And this game ain't fair, y'all. It's just not fair. You do the right thing, you beat the line move, and you lay it hard, and then you just get robbed. You just get robbed blind. It happens. It's all right. We are going to go ahead and move on here. So the first fight of the evening, Jordan Griffin versus Yusef Zalal. Jordan Griffin was really amped up at weigh-ins. He looks like he's pumped. He looks like he's ready to go. Now, as a Zalal backer, that gives me a little bit of pause, but I still like my spot. You know, emotion only takes you so far. At a certain stage, it's the skill, it's the ability, it's what you do inside the cage that really matters. I've got Yusef Zalal as a underdog. I think I got plus 115 and I still like him. However, the the longer that price gets, the less I like him because he was a decent bit smaller than Jordan Griffin. He is planning on dropping a weight class in the near future. So those kinds of things do concern me, especially when Jordan Griffin's bread and butter is the ground game. If he can get on top of Zalal, we may be in trouble, but I think Zalal can manage to keep this thing in his wheelhouse or he's the better wrestler. Get on top of Griffin and stay safe once it does hit the mat. Not a whole lot changes my opinion on that particular fight. Kay Hansen taking on Jin Frey. Um, both these women, totally professional, weighed in, got it all done, looked good on the scales. Uh, Jin Frey looked phenomenal. She's a, incredibly muscular, very, very fit, in good shape. She looked amazing, but she's moving up a weight class, taking on Kay Hansen, who's used to fighting higher. I know there's a lot of people on Kay Hansen. I still feel like this is a dogger's past spot. I mean, Kay looked a little bit nervous. I don't know if that's just because it's her first time at the UFC and she's a 20-year-old young fighter. I mean, all I can say is that if I had to make a bet, I would be looking towards the underdog. Uh, Kay has that farm strength, though. We've talked about that a lot, that if she can get on top of Junior Frey, she can probably ride out some kind of a decision. There is that threat. But I think Junior Frey is coming to fight. I think she's going to make this close. She's going to make it hairy. The best option may be a pass. But if I had to pick, I still would lean with the dog and the championship experience. Takashi Saito gets a last second step in to fill in for my boy that got dropped off the card. We've got Jason Witt. Now, both these guys look good at weigh-ins. Jason Witt is a little bit smaller than Takashi, but he's also a little bit thicker. Sato looks like he lost a little muscle definition to me. I don't know if that's just my eyes playing tricks on me or what that is, but he seemed a little slimmer this time around than I'm used to seeing him on the scales. Really on this one, it becomes a pass for me at this point. We don't have a line out at this point. I need to research Jason Witt and see exactly what this kid's all about before I can tell you one way or the other if I want to make a bet on it. Generally speaking, last minute step ins, you fade them because they don't have a full camp. They're not on, you know, they're not ready to go, but Jason looked in shape and we saw last week a couple of dogs that came in on late notice had really great performances and some of them even won inside the distance because they stayed ready. They knew the UFC call could be coming and I feel like Jason Witt might be one of those guys. He looked like he was in damn good shape. He may have been on call by the UFC in this kind of a situation. When the tweet went out that uh, Brahimaj was dropped out of the fight, they immediately tagged Jason Witt as the replacement. So I feel like maybe they knew this was a possibility or they had some people ready to go in the wings for these cards this time around. So he may have more of a camp than we realize. Um, main event of the preliminary card, we've got Luis Pena taking on Karma Worthy. And Karma looked good, folks. I've got a two-banger on Karma. I believe I'm going to go ahead and back this dog here. I am not a believer in Pena. He looked fine. He looked the same that he always does. The dude is a string bean, very, very skinny. And I mean, he's huge for the weight class, but because of that, he's tiny. And he does have a decent amount of muscle definition because you can't have any fat on your bones if you're going to make that kind of a weight cut. So nothing exciting from Luis Pena on the weight one way or the other. And then Kama, he looked good. He looked thick. He looked muscular. I know that you can't always buy into one guy has muscles and the other one doesn't. But when you look at their body types, their frames, I think Kama's going to pose some problems for Pena. And in the interviews that I've been listening to, he's fully aware that Pena is going to want to grapple with him. He knows Pena is not going to want to step in the middle of the cage and strike with him. He's not an idiot. So I really like my spot on Worthy here. I like how he looked at the weigh-ins. 
and he's just not that much smaller when you compare Pena to some of his previous opponents, and that reach is going to make a huge difference. Pena enjoys a very, very large reach, and Worthy's going to be able to match that reach in this spot, so I think it's going to cause some problems for Pena. Hopefully, he comes through us. Um, really messes up my strategy, though, because I was <laughs> I had two big dogs that I had big plays on, and the idea there is to go one and one and then squeeze out a profit, but when you lose one dog, it's all on the other. Now I need you to win, worthy buddy. Come on, man. Come through for me. We got uh, Sean Woodson taking on Julian Juicy J. Arosa, another late replacement. Kyle the Monster Nelson couldn't get his visa stuff taken care of to get here from Canada. So Juicy J steps in. He looked pretty good on the scales. I'll be honest. He is another one of these fighters that looked like he didn't roll off the couch. He looked like he came in ready to go. However, can't trust this guy's chin. He's been knocked out in three of his last four fights, I believe. And Sean Woodson, he's got that boxing experience. He's going to have that height, that reach advantage. Um, I need to do a little bit more tape study on Julian Arosa to see what he is all about. But I feel like Sean Woodson's going to knock him out. I really do. Especially with that big step in knee. We talked about that on the podcast, on the round table. I've mentioned it a couple of times. Woodson's step in knee is something else. And if Juicy J comes in, and puts his head down. I know he does that from time to time. He can get clipped. And if he gets clipped by that big old knee, especially if he doesn't have a gas tank, if this happens in round two or round three, I think Woodson can put him down. I might be uh, taking a look at Woodson inside the distance or by knockout to see if that's even worth taking a shot because obviously he's a massive favorite. Um, I don't even feel comfortable parlaying him at minus 500 just because you're not getting that much value out of it. You can't do a two-teamer. You'd have to do a three-teamer to even get even money on him. Um, not looking forward to that. Philip Lenz taking on Tanner Bozer. This is the one, folks. This is the one. Your boy added a late play. I've been talking about it. I was trying to get plus 100 or plus 110 on Tanner Bozer. It didn't happen. I got minus 105. So we got close, but it's close enough. I will take it. I'm locking up Tanner Bozer. I'm making the play here. Philip Lenz, he definitely is off the juice. I talked about it before in the podcast. I think when he was in the PFL and he was running rampant and he won that million dollars, I think he was juiced to the gills. The dude was shredded. He was huge. He had a six pack. I mean, just big physicality for a heavyweight. And he came in a little flabby. I mean, when he flexes, you can see the muscle is underneath there, but he's not in the kind of shape that he was in when he won the PFL championship or in earlier in his career. So that gives me a little bit of pause there. I don't think he's going to be the same Philippe Lenz that we've seen in the past. And Tanner Bozer, he's been talking about how he's been trapped in by himself. He's been trying to work out on his own because he hasn't had access to a gym. Kid put some muscle on. I think this may have been a good thing for him. He looked in shape. He was up on he was up on stage flexing for the camera, giving the he was putting on a show. He knows he looks good. He knows he added the muscle. He's coming in confident. He's ready to go. I love his leg kick game. And I don't know if Lenz is gonna be able to get this fight to the mat. Even if he does, I think Bozer's got the kind of gas tank and stand-up game that he's gonna need to counteract that. So I'm gonna take the shot. I love Bozer here. I saw everything I needed to see at the weigh-ins to give me that extra little edge of confidence to go ahead and pull that trigger and getting a pick em price on him. I'll take it. Let's go can uh, Tanner Bozer. Bulldozer. Uh, we've got Brendan Allen taking on Kyle Dawkus. And this is the one that I passed on it to begin with. I'm passing on it now. Nothing changed. Both these guys, consummate professionals, they step on the scale. They're roughly the same height. They look like they've got roughly the same reach. They match up extremely well with one another. I just can't do it. Um, I like Brendan Allen. I think he does end up getting it done, but he's a minus 300 or higher favorite. And he's taking on a very, very dangerous submission guy, which is Brandon Allen's wheelhouse. So not touching it. Nothing changed here at the weigh-ins. Nothing exciting to tell you on that one. Uh, heavyweight matchup, Gian Vellante taking on Maurice, the crochet boss green. There were two that were exciting to talk about, and this is the other one. Actually, that's a lie. The next, they're all exciting. Stay tuned. <laughs> Gian Vellante really looks like he rolled off the couch. He is the loser of the weigh-ins for UFC Poirier versus Hooker. This guy had a beer gut. I talked about how at 205, he looks like he's an overblown middleweight. Not a very big man. At heavyweight, he just doesn't look like he trained. No time spent on the airdyne, no running. I don't even know if he got up for this fight because he legitimately had a saggy, flabby gut hanging out in front of him. He didn't even bother with it. Crochet Boss on the other side of this thing. He's a much bigger man, so you've got to expect a little bit of flab around his waist and stuff like that simply because those guys can't all be built like Francis Ngannou. Francis is a genetic freak. 
Maurice Green, you could see the abs underneath the flap when he when he moved around, when he stood up, when he stretched. You could see the six pack is there. He is ready to go. Green looks in very good shape. And before I mentioned that if it was going to be a side, it was going to be Green. Something's been itching in the back of my brain this week telling me maybe Volante is live here. Maybe Volante is live here. I don't know what it was, but some little voice in the back of my head was telling me to watch out for this spot. After seeing that weigh-ins, Volante is not live here, folks. He's going to have about one round of gas in him, and I know Maurice Green has a tendency to gas out in his fights as well, but I think he's just going to put it on him. I like Maurice Green here. I like him a lot. If you want to use him as a parlay piece at this point, I would say go right ahead simply because... Volante showed me nothing at the weigh-ins, and you can't really expect a guy to come in looking like Roy Nelson. Now, I know Roy Nelson always looks like Roy Nelson, and that's the key, is that he's used to being that way. Volante looks like he's just not even in this fight. I expect him to get wrecked here. Uh, Mike Perry taking on Mickey Gall. Perry looked bad on the scales. He looked exhausted. They had to remind him to put his mask back on because he just kind of dropped all of his clothes before he walked to the scale. He was bitching the entire time. And then he gets up on the scales. He looks relieved to have made weight. He doesn't flex or anything like that. And I, a big red flag, big, big, big red flag for Mike Perry for this whole thing. Mickey Gall was in good spirits. He made weight. He looks like he added some muscle. He looked in shape. He looked ready to go. Then when they got to the stare downs, Mike Perry apparently got some water in him. He apparently hydrated up because he was bouncing around. He was being his old crazy self. He was trying to get some kind of a reaction or a flinch out of Mickey Gall. They couldn't get up in each other's grills because obviously the COVID situation, so they had to keep their distance. And uh, I'm not sure what to take from that. So I've got a point for and a point against on uh, the weigh-ins for Mike Perry here. Mickey Gall just kind of stood stone-faced, let him do his thing, wasn't bothered at all by it. I don't know what to make of this. I really feel like Mike Perry smashes Mickey Gall under normal circumstances. If Mike Perry did struggle with the weigh-in, if he was somehow compromised because of the situation right now, then Gall probably is live here. But I can't trust Mickey Gall with my money. And even if he did add some more muscle, that muscle takes oxygen. We've seen Gall gas out over and over and over again. And if he gets in there and gasses out against Perry, he's going to have a short night. So I am, again, just staying away from this one. If you want to take the stab on Gall after what I saw at the weigh-ins, I wouldn't blame you. But I still think Mike Perry gets it done. The way he was jumping around when they were facing off with each other, you got to have energy to do that. So I feel like maybe he was just playing it up on the weight, on the scales when he looked really bad. Maybe he was just trying to get a reaction, showing off. We all know Perry's mentally unstable. He does this stuff. It's very questionable. We never know why he does it. But I, I can't say that I have confidence in either side on that fight. Going to the main event, we've got Dustin Poirier taking on Dan the Hangman Hooker. And this one... Again, just a set of consummate professionals. These guys both came in early. They both got on the scales. They both look damn good. And the things that surprised me were Dan Hooker looks like he's in phenomenal shape. I mean, he always looks good, but kind of similar to a couple of guys I've mentioned already. He looks like he packed on some muscle. His biceps look bigger. His abs look very pronounced. He's in very good shape, extremely good shape, ready to go in this fight. And the other thing that surprised me is Dustin Poirier is not as small as I thought he was. I know Dan Hooker's got the height and reach advantage, but it's not as significant as I thought it was before. So again, this is kind of a point for a point against. When I saw Hooker on the scales, I went, damn, I'm on the wrong side of this thing. I need to bet Hooker at dog money. I know a lot of people betting Hooker at dog money right now. I wish you all luck. I don't blame you there. But Dustin Poirier looked fantastic himself, and he didn't look small. I thought he was going to be a decent chunk smaller than he actually was. And in the smaller cage, we talk about Dustin needing to be able to close that distance to get in on Hooker. It's going to be much easier to do with the small cage. So again, I'm steering clear. Um, I'm just going to kind of stick to my guns on that one and stay away. I did end up betting the over two and a half on this one. I think they get into the third round. I think they get into the fourth round. And uh, even making it to the judges' scorecards is a very interesting situation, if not a late finish in the fourth or fifth rounds, but if you're taking that shot on Hooker, I don't blame you one bit. Good luck on all your action this weekend, folks. That is the recap video. Hit me up on Twitter. Let me know if you've got any additional questions at Pod. Subscribe to Odds HQ. Head on over to the Die Hard MMA Podcast YouTube channel. Give me a subscription there. Good luck, everybody. Let's roll.